Hey there folks, welcome to Spectrum Pulse. We talk about music, movies, art, and culture. And I gotta say, it, it feels a little bit weird being back to a more conventional episode of this series. I might do another genre-specific episode sometime soon. They're surprisingly fun to put together. But in the meantime, let's get on the pulse. So we got six projects on the docket. Let's first go back and talk about from Red Velvet, Queendom. <laughs> So here's something you probably would not expect from me. When I went back through Red Velvet's back catalog in preparation for this EP review, I was surprised just how much I liked them. Seriously, colorful but well composed and balanced with some solid R&B inspired harmonies. Going off their albums, they kind of remind me of a K-pop little mix, and for me that's absolutely a compliment. But it also kind of had me worried going into this EP, because I know what happened to little mix with the ships in mainstream pop, especially with the reviews for the EP being a little bit more lukewarm than I would like to see and that was coming from fans and unfortunately it's kind of true with this project which is not bad because Red Velvet sells the rock solid vocal harmonies and a solid foundation in pop and R&B to give them a high floor but you can also tell that this is a band that's stuck with the jingling trap inflected percussion dense late 2010s pop sound that really crippled Little Mix's LM5 and it doesn't always play to Red Velvet's more colorful melodic strengths that we got on their album. Now, to their credit, I would argue on average their production's a little bit more consistent and polished than I think Psycho Music shoved out, with a little bit more attention paid to the bass grooves, and lyrically, Red Velvet doesn't embarrass themselves, splitting in between a couple empowerment flexes and a tiny relationship arc spread over the last four songs, a few odd references on Knock on Wood notwithstanding, and more than made up for Hello Sunset as the album Closer, which flips into what almost sounds like an early 80s R&B flip, and I actually really Really like it. But overall, it's just a little bit more muted than it needs to be, which holds back the couple good songs we got here from being truly great, so solid 6 out of 10. It's very likable, but Red Velvet have done better on their albums. This just does not have the moments that put it properly over the top. That's all. Next up from Big Red Machine, how long do you think it's gonna last? Would it be the first renegade to need somebody? In all due fairness, I had good excuse to ignore Big Red Machine the first time. Oh look, a collab from Aaron Dessner and Justin Vernon following their most jittery, electronically enhanced albums to date, neither of which I liked all that much. Which, going back to this project's debut, also proved very true. But how was I supposed to predict that both artists would wind up making friends with Taylor Swift of all people, or sliding back towards their more organic indie material that made them in the early 2010s, which in certain circles seems to be picking up a little bit of a premature nostalgia cycle. Well, what we got here was a collaborator studded project that's sprawling over an hour, so I really wanted to give this a lot of time to properly sink in for me. And now that I have, it really annoys me that I do not like this more. What I find interesting is how conversational this album feels. Our front men are tired and pensive. They're wearily staring out into the middle distance of their past and present, asking a lot of fractured questions about how much any of this matters, and then trying to stubbornly cling to fleeting control, even despite the losses of those around them. And nearly every guest star is a voice that's echoing in to challenge their scene. I'll admit some spiky guitar work, the choppy percussion spanning drum machines, and more some more developed and well-miked live drums, and a lot of fractured auto-tune and vocal mixing. And I mean, that shouldn't be a surprise. At this point, we can expect what a Dessner vernon collab will sound like in terms of the buttery, liquid textures split across by the stuttering grooves, and very few moments that rise above the soft focus mid-tempo and don't achieve the climax that they should. But what did surprise me was just how much an album like this kind of needs the gut shots that are like Taylor Swift on Renegade, or even Robin Pecknell, the Fleet Foxes provided on Phoenix, with more of a distinct, direct presence that's cutting through all the ennui. It's Kimbra's verse on Gauthier, somebody that I used to know, that for all the plaintive navel-gazing and whinging, there's other people in that picture who deserve a voice too. And where this album gets any a proper impact is highlighting the complicated emotional dynamics that comes with all the messy interactions in that framing. Helped by new 
Auburn, you get the impression of that how much we might need each other in this fleeting world might have been something close to a loose thematic point. But I also have to say this. Those moments are very few and far between, especially on a languid project with no momentum and very few points that really break out of that mist. Say what you will about a band as willowy as Sundays, they at least care to write some stronger hooks that'll be more actively self-critical, and they don't have to rely so goddamn heavily on Justin Vernon's higher-pitched warble or falsetto, or Aaron Dessner's mostly unremarkable delivery, I gotta say it. And then there's the songwriting missteps that I just can't ignore, like how Magnolia is trying to comfort a friend who has been abused by a partner, and its peppy sense of upbeat cheer feels really lacking in intimacy and feels utterly misplaced, or how we get a tribute to the late frightened rabbit singer Scott Hutchinson that feels utterly bloodless and so distant. More about how the death impacted them rather than celebrating his legacy. I mean, Coldplay fumbled this too, and it was just as frustrating. Come on here. But that sense of hazy distance is all over this album, where you get glimpses of the shoe that should drop, but it never really does. In other words, I can call this a definition of a side project. But when Matt Beringer did the L Vi project in 2015, he, well, effectively deconstructed the entire soft focus, self-serving vanilla near, to which this album feels like a deliberate early 2010s throwback, with a few great tunes, but not enough to save it. 6 out of 10. Folks, I gave this a full month. I really wanted to like this more. Next up from Turnstile, Glow On. So a bit of a change of pace, going into hardcore with this one, well, okay, mostly hardcore, as this Baltimore band began switching up the sound with fragments of post-hardcore, and even Rage Against the Machine-esque rap rock to go into more off-kilter directions almost immediately, to some really promising results too, mostly because this is a band with a pop sensibility to go along with the bruising impact. And that's probably the album that pushes this glossy contrast to the limit, not just in keeping up the hardcore riffs and the breakdowns and the song structure, albeit cleaned up a fair bit courtesy of production from Mike Elizondo, but still impeccably balanced with some killer bass lines from Franz Lyons and some glossy analog keyboards integrated with the brighter guitar leads. Again, this album's melodic as hell, but also by bringing in more clean vocal lines, more complex groove passages and breakdowns, and even Dev Hines of Blood Orange to sing and contribute to the dreamy vibe that always serves as a burbling counterbalance to all that rage. What it reminds me of most are as the fluttering balance between the pop textures and the pummeling aggression that we got snippets of on Paradise by White Lung five years ago. But Turnstile's approach feels more wide-ranging than even that, while still maintaining that hardcore sense of tightness from some of the languid, sputtering haze of psychedelia with a couple of the occasional vocals from Julian Baker, to even some burbling touches of modern indie pop, for better and worse. Which might be why they left some of the goofier hand claps to sneak in, which can't always say I liked. Now, I will say that there's a part of me that does wish that the old, grisly heaviness of their early hardcore origin existed in more stark contrast with the popular elements, push more of a Rolo Tomasi vibe, maybe. Or that said pop elements led to slightly more defined hooks, as I can't quite escape the feeling of compromise rather than a true synthesis of all their strengths. But that is me nitpicking here, especially when the hooks are still pretty damn solid. The production is everything I wish that the armed was earlier this year, and when you delve into a lot of the thematic subject matter, this does seem to fit. Turns out I've been kind of cagey when it comes to actually describing their writing process, but in exploring the conscious split between the visceral now that might be more hemmed in and whatever might come next, so we need to fill the hole with whatever vibrant spirit and power we can, especially for those that we've lost and we want to celebrate them, the sound does kind of encapsulate that intent. Overall, just a really damn solid genre fusion. I'm not quite over the moon about this as some hardcore and indie fans are, because I've seen this approach before, with a little bit more crunch, a little bit more lyrical meat, but I also can't deny how pure ear candy this project can be, so light 8 out of 10. Not sure where the hell Turnstile is gonna go from here, but I did enjoy this filling in a void. I will say that. Next up from Carly Pierce, 29, written in stone. Knows how to make you think you're the best thing, but I know what happens next, girl. 
So when I covered Next Girl on Billboard Breakdown a couple weeks back, I articulated some of my frustrations with Carly Pierce as a mainstream country act. She's a solid voice, reasonably good taste in production with above average writing, the sort of act I would normally wholeheartedly endorse coming out of Nashville, and yet I've never been able to get into her sound as much as I would like to be. And going through her back catalog, I think I identified why. Her investment. This is where Carly Pierce's technical refinement has wound up paradoxically kind of hurting her a bit, because this always seemed to place her a bit at a distance from her best material, preventing that added bit of texture from really coalescing to sell some of these moments. She sounds like the sort of performer who had it all figured out, even getting married to a fellow country star, and in a Nashville country framework that's almost a guaranteed pipeline to consistent mid-level success. And then this happened, where in the wake of of the death of her longtime producer Busby and her divorce from Michael Ray, we get an expansion of her 29 EP with a slew of new songs for the sort of focused divorce album that placed her stylistically closer to the output from the Pistol Annies. Ergo, it's no surprise, it's handily her best album to date. And really, it's an improvement across the board. The autobiographical subtext means that Carly Pierce allows herself to sound a little bit more raw and visceral, the perfect veneer audibly cracking so the emotionality does feel a little more real, which is a great compliment for production that brings in more twang, neo-traditional fiddle and pedal steel, slightly rougher guitars, and even vocal production where there's allowed to be a bit more grit, not always to her benefit, it can feel a little awkwardly mastered on a couple songs, but still, and bringing in Ashley McBride and Brandy Clark to join Natalie Hemby as co-writers adds a different sort of edge that's actually very welcome, aka there's some actual edge this time. But what I think sets this project apart from the traditional breakup album that you might expect is what Carly Pierce brings herself. Beyond the fact that her writing has always been willing to embrace scenes with a little bit more complicated and messy framing, highlighting the culpability of both herself and her ex, what's all the more effective here is that you can tell that Carly Pierce had a plan for where she wanted to be at my age, we're nearly the same age, the breakup that was never really a part of it and she's desperately trying to hold it all together in the result. 29, the title track, winds up a pretty devastating song in that regard. It's probably her best. Maybe not as messy or explosive as Miranda Lambert cutting Mama's Broken Heart, but on some level, that feels a lot more human and real for someone as methodical and untangling the mess as Carly Pierce is. That being said, there are a couple issues I can't really overlook. I do not understand why Nashville labels continue to push the whole EP, then combine with more or tracks to make a full project approach outside of maybe stream trolling because it can make the album feel a little bit bloated. And while it's not nearly as bad as Lauren Elena's last project, it's still somewhat true here. And more to the point, I do feel like this project is a bit transitional. Carly Pierce is a distinctive songwriter. She's becoming a more interesting performer, finally, but the last step is making her sound her own. Her great songs are among the best of mainstream country this year, and that's a high praise, but her mid-tier album tracks need a little bit more uniqueness in tone or production to launch her into another level, beyond just the expected sound that's popular in Music Row. That being said, this is a legit surprise, and it wound up a pretty great album, so light 8 out of 10. Congratulations, Carly Pierce, you got me on board. I can't wait to hear where you go from here. Next up from Poppy, Flux. I remember being generally middling on I Disagree, mostly because it felt like an inelegant attempt to conclude the weird pop metal cult trajectory formed from her first two projects. Maybe it was more transitional and a full breakaway from Titanic Sinclair, it led to a compromised album, but it wasn't one that really wowed me at the time, especially now, and also because it felt like some of her grooves had been compromised in favor of all that new metal-esque heaviness. But okay, fine, I was at least curious to hear Flux, given that after that weird noise experiment, she was going to try for more more conventional, streamlined alt rock, and that's pretty much what we got, all things considered, for better and for worse. Let me start by saying if you were expecting some of that alt metal heaviness of previous projects, and working with Justin Meldel Johnson, Poppy has given up some of that crushing texture from more defined melodic grooves that I've been begging for her to reintroduce for years now. Although there is still enough pummeling breakdowns in the couple tracks to show that she will still use them for real impact, like on On the Level. And paradoxically, even 
even if this album might feel lighter overall, I would argue it still executes its heavier moments more effectively within the context of sharper compositions, if only just in contrast. But that also means if you are enamored with the uncanny weirdness that she initially cultivated through YouTube, or her first album with a lot more synths and pop elements as I really liked, well, this is easily her furthest away from that, and as such, it's probably the album that is most authentically hers or the most organic. But it does wind up sounding a little bit more conventionally late 90s, 2000s alt rock as a result. And Poppy is still not exactly a dynamic or punchy presence behind the microphone, not help it being mixed a little bit quieter than I would prefer. Although, funnily enough, it does feature some uncredited vocals from George Clark of Deaf Heaven on the last track, and his screaming sounds more visceral here than it did on that last Deaf Heaven album. Now, it shouldn't be a surprise that the most direct comparison with this is garbage. And I will say that, at least in terms of subject matter, Poppy is more interesting and potent than Garbage was even this year. Self-identity has been a focal point of her last couple of albums, and here it feels like she's got the firmest grip on it to date. A constantly shifting, passionate vortex barely contained within the industry that wants to box her in, where she is now fully reclaiming her agency and trying to grapple with her depths of emotion it even kind of seemed to spook her a little bit, especially when pursuing a relationship. Now, it's nice to see that she's found some sort of focal point of tranquility within that storm by the very end, but expanding for the rest of the album... You know, it's probably her best since Poppy Computer in terms of pure focused compositions, but I do think it peaks rather early, and even as the more atmospheric passages on the back half were impressive, I think I would have liked a more potent performance to really put this over the top. So very solid 7 out of 10, definitely worth hearing if you want to check out Poppy's newest direction, but I don't expect she's going to stay here, so we'll see what happens. And finally, from Alessia Cara, In The Meantime. Did I get fooled or are you a fool just like me? You know, I was prepared to ignore this altogether, or at least veto it. I mean, who still really cares about Alessia Cara? Where even in Canada, the hits are starting to run dry, and she wasn't really that interesting to begin with in comparison with a lot of her peers, especially in hindsight. Now granted, there's a lot of factors here that aren't really her fault. She couldn't have predicted the rise of the other teenage starlets who brought way more intensity and experimentation to the table, and actually seemed to have the focus and support of their label, which highlights the larger issue with Alessia Cara and that nobody in Def Jam seems to have the slightest clue of what to do with her, especially when her more transitional sophomore album seemed to want to focus more on sober, thoughtful, adult alternative material and actually had some promise. I said that when I reviewed it. Plus, she does actually have a fan base. I'm still shocked to this day that my Alessia Car reviews have gotten as much traction as they have. So, I'll admit, I was curious where she was going to go with this. And yet with this project, I'm puzzled where the hell she was looking to go. Half the feel of this album is very languid, pulling on touches of cod reggae and the sort of coffeehouse adult alternative that she was starting to explore on her second album, placed alongside more elaborately orchestrated bedroom pop tones that dabble with bassy R&B and hip hop that kind of reminded me of her breakthrough except minus no idea in production so just nowhere near as good. And the common thread between those two styles is a level of internally composed intensity and texture that, I gotta be honest, I'm not sure Alessia Cara quite has. Once again, it feels like a case where she's absolutely got the ambition to approach some more sophisticated material. I'm just not sure the execution's enough to get there. And while some of this is on Alessia Cara, who sounds like she's playing to increasingly prim and detached pop tones, and just doesn't quite have the expressive texture in her voice to sell the style she's attempting. I mean, I might not really care for Arlo Parks, but she nails a lot of what Alessia Cara does far better, but a lot of the production feels very desaturated, inorganic, and monochromatic, especially in the spare melodies that rarely stand out and make an already long and scattered album feel a hell of a lot longer. But normally this could be anchored or compensated for by great writing, normally a saving grace for Alessia Cara's material, and yet this time, the more listens I gave it, the less I was gripped. Part of this has the feel of being a quarantine album, where during lockdown Alessia Cara used the time to write the 
the vast majority of this album, dig deep, explore the contradictions of her passions and urges, but it doesn't quite mind much in the way of unique insight out of a lot of it. A lot of muted clash, but not enough resonant payoff, and not making a point out of that clash in the begin with. And that might as well be the story of her past couple albums. And now I can't blame her for all this. Sweet Dream was a terrible lead-off single, way too reminiscent of Melanie Martinez. Her label seems to treat her with casual disinterest, and we've already seen how the whole quarantine record thing might kind of age poorly, or at least have a limited shelf life when you realize just how little can be mined out of a very tedious experience the past year and a half. But I gotta say, this album feels like a boring wallow with a lot of promise that just falls really flat. An isolated bubble of an experience without a killer hook or three, it fades remarkably quickly. So five out of 10, hate to say it, you're likely gonna forget this game out this year, even if you might be a diehard fan. Just saying. So yeah, thanks a lot for watching. If you'd like to like and subscribe, I'd be more than grateful. I imagine I kind of ended on a downer note there, but hey, look, I've been on Alessia Cara's side for a while now, more than a lot of mainstream critics. I wanted to like this, but again, it just doesn't give me much to work with here. Beyond that, though, if you guys have any comments, leave them down there below. And hey, if you guys want to get involved in my scheduling process or join my Discord to talk to me more about this, link to my Patreon is right out of, over there. Once again, please don't feel obligated to contribute. I do have something coming down the pipe which might get more of you involved, but again, it's coming, so please keep your eye out for more stuff coming on this channel or whatever I'm putting on my social media. But hey, until then, I'm Mark. You're watching On The Pulse on Spectrum Pulse. And I'll see you next time.